Good morning, or whatever time it is for you. It's Brianka J. Welcome back to my little corner of the internet where we talk all things books, but today it's a spooky edition. Today I'm going to give you a classic short story, and I think I'm I'm aspiring to do one classic spooky story every day to Halloween. So, if that's what we're going to do, and you like that idea, stay tuned. Okay, guys, make sure you comment, like, subscribe. I know we always have a good time for story time. These are really fun to share with a class or just listen while we're working, and they're great. Make sure you comment, like, subscribe. It gives me so much energy. And let's get into this spookiness. Today's story is Chicamagua by Ambrose Beers. And it was first published in the San Francisco Examiner in January 20th, 1889. On one one sunny autumn afternoon, a child strayed away from its rude home in a small field and entered a forest unobserved. It was happy in a new sense of freedom from control, happy in the opportunity of exploration and adventure. For this child's spirit embodies of its ancestors have for thousands of years been trained to memorable feats of discovery and conquest. Victories in battles whose critical moments were centuries, whose victors camps were cities of home stone. From the cradle of its race, it had conquered its way through two continents and passing the great sea had penetrated a third, there to be born to war and dominion as a heritage. The child was a boy aged about six years old the son of a poor planter. In his younger manhood, the father had been a soldier, had fought against naked savages and followed the flag of his country into the capital of a civilized race to the far south. In the peaceful life of a planter, the warrior fire survived, once kindled, it is never extinguished. The man loved military books and pictures and the boy had understood enough to make himself a wooden sword. Though even the eye of his father would hardly have known it for what it was. This weapon he now bore bravely as became the son of a heroic race. And pausing now and again in the, in the sunny space of the forest assumed with some exaggeration the postures of aggression and defense that he had been taught by the engraver's art. Made reckless by the ease of with which he overcame invisible foes attempting to stay his advance. He committed the common enough military error of pushing the pursuit into a dangerous extreme until he found himself upon the margin of a wide but shallow brook whose rapid waters barred his direct advance against the flying foe that had crossed with illogical ease. But the interpret victor was not to be baffled The spirit of the race which had passed the great sea burned inconquerable in that small breast and would not be denied. Finding a place where some boulders in the bed of the stream lay but a step or a leap apart, he made his way across and fell again upon the rear guard of his imaginary foe, putting all to the sword. Now that the battle had been won, Prudence required that he withdraw to his base of operations. Alas, like many a mightier conqueror, and like one, the mightiest he could not. Curb the lust for war, nor learn that tempted fate will leave the loftiest star. Advancing from the bank of the creek, he suddenly found himself confronted with a new and more formidable enemy. And the path that he was following sat bolt upright with ears erect and paws suspended before it, a rabbit. With a startled cry, the child turned and fled. He knew not in what direction, calling with inarticulate cries for his mother, 
weeping, stumbling, his tender skin cruelly torn by brambles, his little heart beating hard with terror, breathless, blind with tears, lost in the forest. Then, for more than an hour, he wandered with erring feet through the tangled undergrowth, till at last, overcome by fatigue, he lay down in a narrow space between two rocks. Within a few yards of the stream, and still gasping, grasping his toy sword, no longer but a weapon, but a companion, sobbed himself to sleep. The wood birds sang merrily above his head. The squirrels whisking their bravery of tail, ran barking from tree to tree. Unconscious of the pity of it, and somewhere far away was a strange muffled thunder as if the partridges were drumming in celebration of nature's victory over the son of her immemorial slaver, enslavers. Enslavers, sorry. And back at the little plantation where white men and black were hastily searching the fields and hedges in alarm, a mother's heart was breaking for her missing child. Hours passed, and then the little sleeper rose to his feet. The chill of the evening was in his limbs. The fear of the gloom in his heart, but he had rested and he no longer wept. With some blind instinct, which impelled to action, he struggled through the undergrowth about him and came to a more open ground. On his right, the brook. To the left, a gentle acclivity, studded with infrequent trees. Overall, a gathering gloom of twilight. A thin, ghostly mist rolled along the water. It frightened and repelled him. Instead of recrossing in the direction whence he had come, he turned his back on, upon it and went forward toward the dark enclosing wood. Suddenly he saw before him a strange moving object, which he took to be some large animal. A dog? A pig? He could not name it. Perhaps it was a bear. He had seen pictures of bears, but knew of nothing to their discredit and had vaguely wished to meet one. But something in form or movement of this object, some thing in the awkwardness of its approach, told him that it was not a bear, and curiosity was stayed by fear. He stood still, and as it came slowly on gained courage every moment, for he saw that at least it had not the long, menacing ears of the rabbit. Possibly, his impression of mind was half conscious of something familiar in its resolve, his doubts, he saw that it was followed by another and another, to right and to left, or many more. The whole open space about him was alive with them, all moving toward the brook. They were men. They crept upon their hands and knees. They used their hands only, dragging their legs. They used their knees only, their arms hanging idle at their sides. They strove to rise to their feet, but fell prone in one attempt. They did nothing naturally and nothing alike, save only to advance foot by foot in the same direction. Singly, in pairs, and in little groups, they came on through the gloom, some halting now and again, while others crept slowly past them, then resuming their movement. They came by dozens and by hundreds, as far, as far on either hand as one could see in the deepening gloom, they extended and the black wood behind them appeared to be inexhaustible. The very ground seemed in motion toward the creek. Occasionally, one had paused, did not again go on, but lay motionless. He was dead. Some, pausing, made strange gestures with their hands, erected their arms, and lowered them again, clasped their heads, spread their palms upward, as men are sometimes seen to do in public prayer. Not all of this did the child know. It would have been noted by an elder observer. He saw little but that these were men, yet crept like babes. Being men, they were not terrible, though unfamiliarly clad. He moved among them freely, going from one to another and peering into their faces with childish curiosity. All their faces were singularly white, and many were streaked with gout and gouted with red. Something in this too, perhaps, in their grotesque attitudes and movements, reminded him of the painted clown whom he had seen last summer in the circus, and he laughed as he watched them. But on and ever on they crept, 
these maimed and bleeding men. As heedless as he of the dramatic contrast between his laughter and their ghastly gravity. To him, it was a merry spectacle. He had seen his father's Negroes creep upon their hands and knees for his amusement. Had ridden them also, making believe they were his horses. He now approached one of these crawling figures from behind and with an agile mo movement mounted it astride. The man sank upon his breast, recovered, flung the small boy fiercely to the ground as an unbroken colt might have done, then turned upon him a face that lacked a lower jaw. From the upper teeth to the throat was a great red, unnatural prominence of nose. The absence of chin, the fierce eyes gave this man the appearance of a great bird of prey, crimsoned in throat and breast by the blood of his quarry. The man rose to his knees, the child to his feet. The man shook his fist at the child. The child, terrified at last, ran to a tree nearby, got upon a father's side of it, and took a more serious view of the situation. And so the clumsy multitude dragged itself slowly and painfully along the hideous pantomime, moved forward down the slope like a swarm of great black beetles with never a sound of going in silence profound, absolute. Instead of darkening, the haunted landscape began to brighten. Through the belt of trees, beyond the brook shone a strange red light. The trunks and branches of the trees were making a black lace work against it. It struck the creeping figures and gave them monstrous shadows, which caricatured their movements on the lit grass. I fell upon It fell upon their faces, touching their whiteness with a ruddy tinge, accentuating the stains with which so many of them were freaked and maculated. It sparkled on buttons and bits of metal in their clothing. Instinctively, the child turned toward the growing splendor and moved down the slope with his horrible companions. In a few moments had passed the foremost of the frog, not much of a feat considering his advantages. He placed himself in the lead, his wooden sword still in hand, and solemnly directed the march, conforming his pace to others and occasionally turning as if to see that his forces did not straggle. Surely, such a leader never before had such a following. Scared about them, <clears throat> now slowly narrowing by the encroachment of his awful march to water, were certain articles to which, in the leader's mind, were coupled no significant associations. An occasional blanket, tightly rolled lengthwise, doubled and ends bound together with a string, a heavy knapsack here, and there a broken rifle. Such things, in short, as are found in the rear of retreating troops, the sport of men flying from their hunters. Everywhere near, everywhere near the creek, which here had a margin of low land, the earth was trodden into mud by the feet of men and horses. An observer of better experience and the use of his eyes would have noticed that these footprints pointed in both directions. The ground had been twice passed over, in advance and in a tree. A few hours before, these desperate stricken men, with their more fortunate and now distant comadres, had penetrated the forest in thousands. Their successive battalions, breaking into swarms and reforming in lines, had passed the child on every side, had almost trodden on him as he slept. The rustle and murmur of their march had not awakened him. Almost within a stone's throw of where he lay, they had fought a battle, but all unheard by him were the roar of the musketry, the shock of the cannon, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. He had slept through it all grasping his little wooden sword with perhaps a tighter clutch and conscious, unconscious sympathy with his martial environment. But as heedless as the grandeur of the struggle, as the dead who had died to make the glory. The fire beyond the belt of the woods on the farther side of the creek reflected on earth from the canopy of its own smoke was now suffusing the whole landscape. It transformed the sinuous line of mist to the vapor of gold. The water gleamed with dashes of red, and red too, where many of the stones protruding above the surface. But that was blood. The less desperately wounded had stained them in crossing. On them too, the child now with eager steps, he was going to the fire. As he stood upon the farther bank, he turned about to look at the companions of his march. 
the advance was arriving at the creek. The stronger had already drawn themselves to the brink and plunged their faces into the flood. Three or four who lay without motion appeared to have no heads. At this, the child's eyes expanded with wonder. Even his hospitable understanding could not accept the phenomenon implying such a vitality as that. After slacking the first, their first, these men had not been, had not had the strength to back away from the water, nor keep their heads above it. They were drowned. In rear of these, the open spaces of the forest showed the leader as many formless figures of his grim command as at first, but not nearly so many were in motion. He waved his cap for their encouragement and smilingly pointed with his weapon in the direction of the guiding light, a pillar to fire to exchange exodus. Confident of the fidelity of his forces, he now entered the belt of woods, passed through it easily to the red illumination, climbed a fence, ran across the field, turning now and again to coquette with his responsive shadow, and so approached the blazing ruin of a dwelling. Desolation everywhere. In all the wide glare, not a living thing was visible. He cared nothing for that. The spectacle pleased, and he danced with glee in imitation of the wavering flames. He ran about, collecting fuel, but every object that he found was too heavy for him to cast in the cast in from the distance to which the heat limited his approach. In despair, he flung in his sword, a surrender to the splendor, superior forces of nature. His military career was at an end. Shifting his position, his eyes fell upon some outbuildings which had an oddly familiar appearance, as if he had dreamed of them. He stood, considering them with wonder, when suddenly the entire platoon, with its enclosing force, seemed to turn as if upon a pivot. His little ward swung half around. The points of the compass were reversed. He recognized the blazing building as his own home. For a moment, he stood stupefied by the power of the revelation, then ran with a stumbling feet, making half circuit to the ruin. There, conspicuous in the light of the conflagration, lay the dread, lay a dead body of a woman. The white face turned upward, the hands thrown out and clutched full of grass, the clothing deranged, the long dark hair in tangles and full of clotted blood. The greater part of the forehead was torn away, and from the jagged hole, the brain protruded, overflowing the temple, a frothy mass of gray, crowned with clusters of crimson bubbles, the work of a shell. The child moved his little hands, making wild, uncertain gestures. He uttered a series of inarticulate and indescribable cries, something between the chattering of an ape and gobbling of a turkey. A startling, soulless, unholy sound, the language of a devil. The child was a deaf mute. Then he stood motionless, with quivering lips, looking down upon the wreck. All right, guys, that is the first story in our spooky series. It's a Chickamauga by Ambrose Beers. So he has a collection of Civil War ta- tales. Um, And he just kind of focuses on these supernatural elements found.